Uh, we seem to have many, Nassim, we seem to have many hands going up. So, uh, it, yeah, but the, before the hands, because because not to make it chaotic, we have our own uh, set of questions from. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so, so let me first start with, with the beginning, okay, um, and then we'll get to the other points. It is going to be unstructured visibly because uh, Ruri is unstructured, but structured in a meta way. Um, let us start with chat GDP. So, uh, from, you know, you, you, from what we know that you're putting some structure, someone uh, mentioned today, you're putting some structure on chat GDP. Uh, trying with chat GDP is pretty much a, a, a stochastic parrot. Well, sometimes get it right, and sometimes well, it's, get it it's, wrong. It's, so go ahead. It's it's ingested, you know, a few billion pages of things that we humans have put on the web, and you know, its goal in life is you give it a prompt, it wants to try to continue that prompt in a way that's reasonable based on kind of the statistics of what it's seen from all those billions of pages it's ingested from the web. So it's it's kind of reflecting, uh, you can call it a so stochastic parrot. Um, I think it's a, it's a parrot with a brain rather like ours um, that uh, is kind of filling in from that prompt in a way that's fairly similar to the way that we managed to fill in from the language that we've kind of learnt from our experience with language. But, you know, it is, it is fundamentally kind of uh, filling in based on the linguistic structure of what it's seen on the web. Now, things happen, like, for example, people are kind of amazed that it seems to be able to follow logic. In a sense, the reason it follows logic uh, is that it's sort of discovered logic from all those texts on the web, just like I think Aristotle discovered logic from hearing, you know, Greek rhetoric and so on, and seeing there were these particular patterns of how sentences got put together in rhetoric that made sense. So it's kind of it's kind of learnt that structure. And I think one of the things that's probably the most scientific interest with, with ChatGPT is that it's kind of showing us that language has a kind of level of structure that we haven't kind of uh, made a made a theory out of before. I mean, you know, we've known forever that language has a sort of syntactic grammar where nouns and verbs go together in particular ways. But what ChatGPT is kind of showing us is that language has kind of a higher level semantic uh, grammar that says, you know, what allows one to put sentences together in a meaningful way. So, you know, it's, it's putting together those puzzle pieces of meaning so that you get kind of reasonable sentences. That's a different thing from being able to sort of actually compute something new. One of the things that sort of happened, you know, in the, in the early days of computers, people kind of thought, oh, computers are going to be giant electronic brains that are going to do just like what human brains do very quickly. And, you know, when neural nets were first invented in 1943, computers were still, you know, there weren't yet electronic computers. People kind of imagined that there was, you know, there were, that these neural nets were going to be sort of brain-like, that then, then computers arose. Then it turned out over the intervening years, neural nets didn't really work out that well, um, but computers worked out really well and computers allowed one to understand how to sort of do these whole towers of computation that are very different from the way that brains do things. And so what we have now is something with ChatGPT that's kind of much more sort of the, the old neural net idea and the old kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, you know, following the, 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 the kind of language that we put on the web. And we have this quite separate thing of being able to make kind of deep towers of computation, being able to do things that humans would never expect to be able to do for themselves in their own brains. I mean, we, we humans are, are pretty good at spinning out language. Um, we're not good at, for example, running serious programs right in our brains. Um, but I have, but, so I have, but I have, I have here a few things that, that because I've been interested uh, that for my new book, I'm talking about verbalism. And verbalism is it's pretty much like I, I had this uh, saying that uh, idiot thinks in labels. So in other words, they don't express themselves, they, but they actually think the labels putting together. I mean, when you hear people, uh, for example, economists talk about the probability, they just recite standard deviation, correlation, and stuff without, without any depth. So I, I know that, so trying to trick chat GDP, uh, 
by asking them by asking it questions uh, to reflect the fact that it uses the most likely statistical explanation, which effectively can be wrong in many places. And so, let me give you two examples. The first one is I tried uh, to add, there is a, a Greek uh, representative of the Ottoman Empire uh, during the uh, uh, Russo, Russian, uh, Turkish, uh, Rus or Ottoman Russian wars, okay, at the table. So, and, and, uh, and, and Greece was siding with Russia visibly against the Ottoman Empire, but he was Greek, constant, is the father of, uh, of uh, the great mathematician, uh, Karatheodorakis. So, Karatheodorakis is Pasha. So, I asked the, the chat GDP, what was the role of Karatheodorakis, uh, Karatheodori, okay, at the uh, uh, meeting of Berlin, at the Congress of Berlin? And it said that he represented Greece, okay? That was, that was we know he represented uh, the Ottoman Empire. That's one way I tricked it, because basically it didn't think, it thinks statistically. So a Greek name and the Greece. So uh, uh, the other one question is, I took a Graham Greene novel and, and asked the novel where, in which there is a lady who is uh, in her 30s, married to a handsome man in his 30s, uh, fit, who ends up uh, sleeping with a poor, um, uh, way overweight and very old man in the 70s in the Caribbean. Okay, and ends up like accidentally. So, so that was that's pretty much Grand Green. And so I asked, uh, and and he was absolutely he had the most boring profession. Okay, and and he was retired on Medicare. So I mean, all the things that are unglamorous and and to describe the relationship. And of course, it portrayed the fellow as very glamorous. And her husband as a loser, rather than the contrary. So someone with a glamorous husband ends up was a. Uh, a loser twice her age was absolutely all the attributes to not like that. And of course, it got it wrong simply because it's a statistical method. Now, of course, you could put boundaries and stuff like that, but it seems to me that th that's one of the defects of statistical method. The other one is, that's the first one, is, is the, the outlier. In other words, you have a sample, it, it works from within samples that extrapolating properly. And in probability, of course, we see it. We've discussed it all the time. You have, uh, there's a huge difference between sample properties and process properties. And the sample may not represent the process. And the second one is something that I call about uh, rigid designation, or uh, basically it commits uh, inconsistencies. Like, like, for example, uh, I asked it to, about my work, I said, what is the criticism, someone asked about me, I just, uh, someone was the criticism of, um, of Taleb, they say Taleb overplays his hand by saying that uh, history is all determined by rare event and historical wars are not determined by their event, okay, very simply. And then, so, and then you ask it to say, uh, is it true that history, uh, you know, historical processes are driven by power laws? which basically means it's going to be driven by the tail, okay? And it answered, yes, uh, historical events, and this is a proof was driven by power laws. So, so here are two inconsistencies because, again, it doesn't think visibly. Uh, uh, so you're telling me that within the language, we're discovering the language is not just words, but there is a hidden logic. There is only logic. There's a hidden, hidden logic that it can capture. But, but these are the defects of, of chat GDP that I've noticed. Yeah. That, that no human, uh, that the humans can, can and, then the, the, uh, and then finally, the final one is in real life, we know where to put the error rate. And that's by, by survival. Like for example, an engineer knows to overshoot in this direction. So we know, and, and that's the whole idea of Ruri is to know what to avoid. In other words, the, there's an error is asymmetric. And like the error of drinking poisoned water versus the error of not drinking, you see, so and stuff like that. So, and we humans know how to put the error, and chat GDP doesn't know, whereas engineers know how to double up to take make an estimate in one direction. You don't have it in the other have it in the other direction, and that so so these are the discussions. So, please let's uh, let us know what you think of that. I mean, look, it's amazing the thing works at all. Nobody expected it. Even the people who built it didn't expect it. I mean, part of the reasons that it had all kinds of strange defects when it first came out was that it was intended to be kind of a research prototype. The, the fact that it reached this threshold where it seems to be able to write sort of meaningful human-like essays was a big surprise to everyone. You know, the, 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 
what it what it is fundamentally doing is something incredibly simple. You know, it it's given a sequence of of words, pieces of text, and it is asked what's going to be, what's the next word that should be filled in, and it just keeps doing that sequentially. It has no planning. It has no. Uh, all it's doing is, in some in some sense, statistically filling in what a reasonable next word should be, and keeping on going with that. So one of the one of the things you can do if you want to sort of play play chat GPT tricks, so to speak, is it'll produce a result and you ask it, is that right? And it'll quite often say, uh, no, that's not right. And it'll go and say, I apologize. I'm, and why is that happening? It's happening because it didn't plan. It just is filling in a word at a time. And when you say, is that right? It is successfully looking back at what it wrote and it's realizing, no, that can't possibly be right. And it's going on and, uh, and correcting itself, so to speak. So it is interesting to see that many of the mistakes it makes are mistakes that are sort of not untypical of human mistakes. Some of them might be, some of them maybe it will be interesting to catalog, which are non-human mistakes. But many of them are quite human. I mean, when it tries to do, you know, some math problem, it'll make human-like mistakes. Now, you know, the thing that it, the thing we've done, uh, I mean, there are many uses for, for LLMs. I mean, the, the thing to understand about LLMs is they provide kind of a, a new kind of interface to computers. We've had things like graphical user interfaces. This is kind of a linguistic user interface. So, you know, a, a typical use case that I think is quite real is you've got five points you want to make, but you have to present them as a report, some big essay type report. So you tell the LLM, take these five points and puff them out into a report. It'll do that. It'll write a a reasonable sounding report that's that's kind of boringly typical of what reports like that might sound like. Then the person who gets the report might say, actually, I only care about these two things about what's being said. So they can use an LLM again to say, take this big boring report and try and grind it down into these two things that I actually care about. So this that's, that's one type of use case for, for LLMs that I think is is perfectly real and, and doesn't, you know, doesn't particularly depend on this these questions about, you know, can it can it figure things out? It that when it comes to, you know, a thing we've done uh, is we built this uh, connection with OpenAI to to ChatGPT, where it can go and ask our computational knowledge systems questions. So what happens is it'll be writing out its kind of answer. It'll get to this point where it says, I need to actually go compute something. Then it will write some special text that is basically picked up by the by the framework of chat gpt and that special text is then sent to wolfram language or wolfram alpha and then we generate we compute an answer give that back to chat gpt then it'll use that to inform what it writes next and it does a pretty good job then uh it's you know it's not perfect yeah, there's a plugin there's a plugin you can have wolfram alpha plugin now with uh yes that's right web version. yeah that, that's that, that's the thing I'm talking about. And, and um, you know, that, that's the, uh, uh, and so long as ChatGPT correctly figures out when to ask us, you know, when to use us as a tool, and assuming that it correctly uses the things we tell it, that helps it a lot. Now, it, um, you know, the question of does it know when to use us? Well, that's partly determined by the prompt that we give it that explains when it should use us. And that's a very bizarre thing because it's kind of like you might think, oh, you're interacting with an AI system that's on a computer and so on. You know, you should be a programmer to do that. But actually, the sort of the key skill that seems to be necessary in writing good prompts is essentially expository writing. You know, because it has basically, because everything it knows, it knows from human writings on the web, it uh, what what uh, you know what ends up being the best way to communicate with it is the same way that is successful for communicating with other humans kind of expository writing it's also kind of fun funny or fun that you know doing things like saying please in the prompt and writing things in capital letters and so on and saying you know do not ever do this and so on has uh, an effect not always precisely the effect you want but it has an effect um it really it really behaves in a very kind of uh, human language like way there but I mean, the, the um, you know, I think the thing that is important to, to realize about, about ChatGPT and machine learning in general is, you know, if you want a precise on the nose, 100% correct answer, 
this is not the place to go. You know, machine learning is good at giving you kind of 80% right, 90% right, maybe. But you never know which 10%, which 20% are going yeah, to be that's, complete nonsense. That, that's probably um, the difference with an expert. Exactly the difference from the expert. The expert knows when when he's about to make a mistake or when it's, he's, uh, he or she is not precise. Whereas the chat GDP doesn't know its degree of precision or, or maybe it will, will in the future, but there, there are kind of some kind of mistakes. That now, uh, 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 so the way to put it also is an expert makes a lot of mistakes, but there's some mistakes that she or he will never make. Right, right. Well, and, and this is, I mean, this relates a lot to questions about sort of the wrapper that you put around machine learning, the wrapper that you put around a large language model, uh, you know, by the time you have the large language model kind of deciding some critical thing in the world, you know, how should you, how should you wrap it in something which can check that it isn't going to do something totally crazy? Interesting topic to discuss, but, but that's, I mean, in, when, it, when it comes to uh, this question of, for example, one of the things that uh, sort of interesting about ChatGPT is the way that it, uh, it sort of, it can do things that seem to us quite creative and original. It's important in writing essays that it won't write the same essay twice because it has this parameter usually called temperature, which basically is, is determining to what extent it will probabilistically pick the next word and to what extent it will deterministically just say, the word I think is the most likely is the one I'll write down there. So for example, uh, you know, essays usually use temperature 0.8 for some reason, which we don't have any idea about, that seems to give a good kind of human-like result. If you crank up the temperature above, I think about 1.2 for, for standard chat GPT, it will just start going bonkers. I mean, it will start kind of, you know, insanely free associating and producing all kinds of crazy nonsensical sentences and so on. So it's it's kind of somehow it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is channeling the idea that, there needs to be a certain amount of randomness, but not too much. If there's too much, there seems to be some kind of phase transition that happens at a certain value of the temperature where the thing just goes bonkers. Um, can you define temperature for us just mathematically so we can... Uh... Yeah, yeah, right. So so it's 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 just the... Okay, so let's take the... the what ChatGPT ultimately does is every successive word or more accurately token, which can sometimes be part of a word that it's going to write, it figures out, the neural net figures out which of those 50,000 possible tokens should occur with what probability. So then it ranks all the possible tokens. So, you know, the word, if you say the cat sat on the, you know, Matt probably has the highest probability, you know, let's say that's a 5% probability, then Sofa has a 1% probability, and then it keeps on going uh, for all the 50,000 possible tokens that uh, uh, it can generate. And um, so it, it gives each one a probability. What the meaning of that quotes probability is? Good question. You know, as you know, the, in what sense is it a probability? Well, it's just a number that is derived from the training of the neural net. We can talk about how that works, but basically, it's a number derived from the training of the neural net. So temperature zero means uh, it's it's using a, a distribution that's so peaked that it will always pick the most probable word it generated. So in this case, it would pick mat. Temperature one means use essentially the, the natural probabilities that the thing generated. So if mat had 5% probability, it will generate mat 5% of the time, so for 1% of the time. Oh, okay, percent. so probability matching, what we call probability matching. I, I guess, I mean, it, it's, yeah, yeah. It, and then it has just an exponential distribution that follows the standard Boltzmann law um, and that's how it kind of interpolates different uh, different ways to yeah I mean the the case the case we just described is is what I guess you would call probability matching. Yeah, yeah, um, probability matching is that, is that if you look at uh, uh, I mean a mistake made by human, if something occurs fifty five percent of the time versus forty five percent of the time, the optimal bet is to bet one hundred percent on the first one. But uh, probability matching is people tend to. Uh, or, or even animals to do 45% of the time with the first on the first one and 45% on the second one, which which is not optimal, but then that's a bias. Uh, so so it probably that that's that would be temperature one is probably matching, and temperature uh -huh. zero is maximum is put the on the maximum probability. That's exactly like uh, decision making 
when you have two alternatives. Right, so Sorry, point eight, I, for some reason, yeah, writes good essays. So I think, uh, Arie, may have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Stefan. Um, Stefan, uh, Arie is, is uh, one of the, the Ruri team uh, people. He's an insurance fellow. Nobody's perfect. Uh, and great, great to see you, Stefan. I, I've got a question out of curiosity. What if a party on purpose dilutes a, a large, large volume of wrong, fake info, conflicting information? Like, how do you vet the actual information and that notion of truth that you can actually secure the, uh, you know, the database of knowledge that, that we have, and that you could not completely uh, make, you know, make it uh, south, yeah, by by inflicting a lot of fake and, and wrong stuff in it. Well, so I mean, in the case of ChatGPT, it's trained, uh, you know, the the biggest part of its training data is this thing called Common Crawl, which is a uh, a crawl of the more savory parts of the human generated web, about 4 billion pages. The, the complete web is maybe in English, 6 billion pages. The, um, the web, you know, maybe it's 10 billion pages of reasonably human generated stuff that's somehow out there on the web. Behind, uh, you know, behind passwords and things, there's maybe 10 times that amount of material uh, in kind of web exposable form. If you look at, for example, the, the complete Oh, things like, uh, you know, the Internet Archive, that's 60 billion pages. Uh, it's unknown how many of those are, are distinct. Um, but so, you know, that what it's doing is it's taking all that stuff that we put on the web, some of which will be complete nonsense, some of which is fiction, some of which is intended to be fiction. It also has taken a few million books. So there are maybe 130 million books that have been published at some point in reasonable form and uh, about 10 million of those have been have been digitized and uh, it's got a few million books. Um, and uh, so, you know, those books might be works of fiction. They might be works of fact. Um, it's just language that humans have chosen to put out there. So at that level, it has no notion of, uh, you know, something like ChatGPT has no notion of truth. It, all it knows is what humans have put out there um, in, in written form. Now, when it comes to something like Wolfram Alpha and uh, you know, our efforts to make kind of knowledge computable, uh, our goal is to have as definitive a source of knowledge as possible. And that's, that's something where you know, some knowledge is uh, that you know, one can, our, what we tend to do is just use uh, kind of systematic uh, sources of knowledge, whether it's you know, the World Bank or something, whether it's uh, uh, some census bureau of some country, whether it's uh, uh, sort of um, uh, definitive things like, you know, we can't answer the question, you know, who's the best actress, but we can say who won the, you know, Academy Award for best actress in such and such a year. Um, and that's, uh, uh, and, and usually, you know, one plainly knows in some cases that the data one has um, isn't likely to be correct. I mean, you know, it's it's a, it's a well-known fact that if you ask countries their population, there'll be a big sort of clustering around, I think, 5 million people, because that's, that's a convenient thing if you're a UN member or some such other thing, and people sort of mysteriously end up with those kinds of numbers. You know, but that's, uh, the, the, the best one can do is have that kind of definitive source of, of data as, as the basis for what one's, what one's computing with. So it, it's, a, it's sort of a different, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat different different kinds of things. But as far as large language models are concerned, all they know is the words that people put on the web, whether they're, uh, have, whether they're intended to be fact or fiction. I have, I, there's one, one, uh, one problem here of, of what I call the self-licking lollipop. And, and that happened with Wikipedia, is that if you get something on Wikipedia, accidentally, and in the days where Wikipedia was bad, supposedly someone may use it, cite it, in, and then if, if someone cites it, then it becomes legit. And then it makes its way back to Wikipedia as, as a real um, thing. Absolutely. And then things kept looping. That was in the early days of Wikipedia. Now it probably is better because it has more filters. But the same thing happened with chat GDP. If, if chat GDP start influencing, you know, uh, falsely influencing Absolutely. results, yeah. So it becomes self-licking lollipop. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, and so one of the issues is more and more pages will be written more and more text that's on the web will have been written by chat GPT like things. 
which will be used for training data for ChatGPT <laughs> like things. And, uh, you know, it, it spirals into kind of the, uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a, you know, in a sense, it's by by the way that it's averaging things, it is sort of the lowest common denominator of what we humans put out there. And, you know, when it tends to write essays and so on, they tend to be very bland. Now, sometimes that's bad. Sometimes that's good. Like, for example, you know, I have a, 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 a digest that we send out at our company every day of sort of new things people have done with LLMs. And I was, you know, it's like you can see all the abstracts people write. And I was like, this is unreadable because every every abstract is written in a different style. Some of them are incredibly ponderous. I said, let's just ask, you know, an LLM to summarize all these abstracts in two sentences each, two sentences each. And it's great. The, you know, the summaries are boring, monotonous, but easy to read. And that's a, you know, that's a good use case. Um, and but you know I think if insofar as the thing sort of eventually will just be sort of uh, learning from its own tail, so to speak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, it's 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 bad. I mean this this you know part of what this kind of begins to highlight is okay. Let's say that the AIs are in charge, so to speak. What will the AIs then do? And one of the things one realizes is the AIs don't really have anything. They are kind of intending to do. There's no, you know, this idea of, of uh, sort of how you set the goals is something that can't come from inside the AIs, so to speak. It's, you know, it, it, the, I think the way of thinking about it is there's, you know, AI provides another kind of automation in the world. What, you know, what automation does is it takes what humans want to do and it makes it as efficient as possible to do those things. But if you say, well, what should the humans do? That's not something the automation is going to be able to tell you. And I, I think it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, I've been curious about kind of what types of human activities, uh, you know, large language models can automate, what they cannot, what the consequences of that automation will be. You know, I think it's been sort of a surprise to people that this kind of intellectual white collar work is something that seemed like it could never be automated. And look, there's a whole bunch of automation that's happening here. And I think, you know, my, my feeling is, you know, having tried to look at kind of what's happened in previous waves of automation in history, it seems like when there's a big piece of automation, you might think, oh, that means people will have nothing to do. But what tends to happen is that what used to be lots of people doing the same thing eventually becomes lots of different fragmented sort of, uh, you know, differently chosen jobs, so to speak. And I, I'm guessing that's, that's, you know, it's now, now we need prompt engineers, we need AI psychologists, we need all kinds of new new types of uh, new types of jobs so i mean maybe this uh, the fact that it replicates a lot of uh, white collar jobs reflects on these jobs because you notice uh, i mean i know from friends of mine who are great doctors uh, that they, they keep telling me that i mean they used to say 90 percent in any profession they're incompetent they're just you know mimicking um but in fact in some fields like medicine it's 99 percent not not ninety percent. They're just reciting, okay. So so uh, and the same thing with uh, journalism. Same thing with, with everything. So what do you think? What other do you think are the profession? That it, it mostly reflects on the profession rather than on something else. Well, perhaps. I mean, you could say. I mean, there's, uh, you know, people have been doing real work, just like back in the day, people did real work pulling plows to plow fields. I mean, people have been doing real work to turn, you know, the five bullet points into a big report. Uh, is it, you say, you know, is it necessarily human work? Well, we thought it was, but now we realize it's not necessarily human work. Just like at some point people would have thought, you know, pulling the plow was necessarily human work. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the question of what will remain as necessarily human work, I think it's, it's almost self-fulfilling because it's kind of, those things which humans specifically have to choose, whether to do this or that, that's something that, uh, you know, kind of necessarily requires human input because the whole point of it is it's a reflection of human choice. Could I, could I, uh, could I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. But sorry, but um, there's, there's a line, Matthew O'Brien comes first, but, but who's this asking a question? Trishan, Trishan. Trishank, yeah, Trishank is, yeah, sorry, the, the faculty, yeah, yeah, go ahead, sorry, I didn't know. Thanks. 
Uh, sorry to cut the line. Um, no, Stephen, no, no, nice no, 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 you're fine. Your, your faculty is, is the primary and then go ahead. Yeah, so so the way, yeah, the way chat, it's amazing what chat GPT can do because it's almost like a Plato's cave experiment. You took an alien, you fed it nothing but human books. And it's amazing it's learned what it can from that at all. What it seems to be missing, I think I gather what Nassim is saying is real world experience. So it might be missing simple things like, I don't know, 3D objects don't tend to collide in space. Um, and I think in your book, you say that you can cover that gap with something like a semantic grammar. You need something more than just knowledge of language. You need knowledge of the real world. How do you yes. think that gap would be covered? Well, as a practical matter, I mean, I think what, what's coming and we've been working hard on this is integrating this essentially linguistic user interface that large language models provide together with actual sort of computational capability. I mean, the fact is that in a sense, what a large language model can do is the same kind of thing that many humans can do kind of just off the top of their head, so to speak. But there are many other things that uh, can be done by using science and by computing things. And that's something that, you know, we've spent decades kind of building the apparatus to do. And linking these two things together, I think is, uh, is the thing that will be, you know, is, is a very powerful thing. Now, now, when it comes to things like, you know, uh, what happens to 3D objects and so on, you have to realize that what ChatGPT is currently dealing with, not for much longer, but, but currently it's just dealing with things it can read from text. So, you know, you tell it to use Wolfram language to draw a picture of a rhinoceros. It will successfully put a bunch of polygons on the page. It won't look much like a rhinoceros and it won't be able to see what it wrote. Um, it's kind of kind of a funny thing to see, um, but you know that's not a fundamental limitation. And in, in, in quite soon, these things will be able to be multimodal in dealing with images. Uh, videos will come next. You know, lots will be learned about how humans typically behave from looking at you know endless videos on the web. Just like a lot can be learned about what humans typically write from all the text that's on the web. So I think these kinds of you know what what in a sense what what ChatGPT has is a knowledge of language and a certain level of common sense that it derives from kind of the overall patterns of what's said in language. Just like logic is sort of derivable from the overall patterns of what's said in language, there's certain other kinds of common sense about how the world works that are derivable that way. Now, as a practical matter, uh, you know, the uh, something like ChatGPT has tried to memorize detailed facts, like, you know, the population of the US is such and such it'll often get that completely wrong and make things up, make up, you know, references that might have been the place it learned this, but it didn't really learn it. And that reference isn't real and, and so on. I think what most people believe is that in the end, what large language models will do well is this kind of linguistic layer plus enough common sense to support the linguistic layer. And when it comes to specifics, use computation, so to speak, drop through to a a, a sort of a, a, a more precise layer. Now, you know, for us, you know, what I've spent the last, I don't know, four decades or something doing is trying to make kind of a computational language that can represent things about the world in a precise computational way. I mean, kind of my, my, my version of this is if you look at kind of what's happened in human history, human intellectual history, one kind of started uh, from uh, kind of, there's just the world out there. And then we invent human language and we start being able to describe things in a somewhat abstract way by just using words like chair and so on to represent this whole category of things that we identify as chairs. So sort of human language is kind of step one of formalizing how we describe the world. Another step would be the invention of logic that we can say, you know, all P's are Q's rather than, you know, all turtles are green or something rather than specifically all turtles are green. Then another level of that kind of organization, formalization, abstraction is mathematics. And you know, that was something that uh, you know, in the starting mostly in the 1600s, became kind of this, this important way of describing certain kinds of things in the world. Uh, my, you know, my belief for the last, well, 40 something years has been that kind of computation is the next level of that, being able to describe the world in computational terms and compute things about what happens in the world, that's kind of the next level of formalizing things. So my, 
my my contention is that kind of computational thinking is kind of it's it's a strangely liberal arts kind of activity to think about things computationally. Um, but it's it's the thing that that kind of will allow people to kind of formalize their thinking about all kinds of different things. And by the way, they can get a computer to help them to actually work out the consequences of that formalization. So in a sense, the you know I see ChatGPT is uh, often a good feeder to that kind of computational language layer because it's capable of writing Wolfram language code, computational language, um, and it's it's a pretty good way of having a linguistic interface to all of that. Being able to sort of say roughly what you mean, it produce the, the workflow is, it seems that's emerging seems to be this. You say roughly what you mean to a chat GPT like LLM, it turns that into precise computational language, which you can read. You say, oh, that's not really what I meant. You know, actually I meant this. I should have been more precise about that. Eventually you get the piece of computational language that actually represents what you, what you wanted to be talking about. Then that's something that becomes sort of solidly executable on a computer. You can use it as kind of a brick to build this potentially big tower of functionality, ideas, whatever else. And that's that's kind of that that seems to be the the sort of emerging workflow that you're using something like ChatGPT as a linguistic interface to at least begin the process of formalizing your thinking, which you can then once you formalize the thinking, then you can start building it up in a systematic way. Uh, before I have one 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 question before we 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 give the audience uh, and becoming more numerous uh, the, some uh, the, the uh, so we're hearing a lot of people are uh, into the, we're, the, this seminar and this uh, is a two week thing on risk management so we're, we're bottom line is risk and everybody is i mean everybody outside this of course uh, is talking about uh, ai as a something that can take over the world the risk from ai and a bunch of people so uh, so we, I mean, I don't know if we haven't discussed it uh, among the Ruri uh, players, but uh, to me, if, if uh, AI, <laughs> we're lucky if we can get a good, uh, uh, robust result in AI for decision making. Decision making is vastly more difficult than just, uh, you know, uh, writing an essay. So, uh, you know, I, I really, I'm not worried about AI. Okay, given, given, uh, you know. Uh, the limitations, the difference between expert and non-expert. So, but what do you think on the point and what's your, uh, what's your take? Well, I mean, look, as a, as a practical matter, saying AI is so important it might destroy the world is certainly a way to make AI seem more important. So that's a, yeah. you know, that's an immediate practical kind of point. Um, uh, you know, the fact is that an increasing number of things, it will be convenient to basically delegate them to AI. Um, that, that it, you know, there are a lot of things where one would like to make a decision more cheaply, more quickly, um, and one will delegate it to AIs. Now, if one does a good job, one will know in this kind of rule of it's going to get it 90% right, but 10% completely wrong, one will know to set up those places to be ones where 90% right is a big win. Like, like if you're, you know, ranking results from a search engine or something, and you and 90% of the results are great, it's a win, even if 10% are completely silly. But if you're trying to decide, you know, should you drive this car in that direction or that direction, it's not really okay to say 10% of the time it will do something totally crazy. Um, uh -huh. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a question of use cases, I think. But I think also that um, uh, in you know in this in this question of uh, uh, kind of uh, well the, the you, you kind of have a choice you can you know when, when you say well I don't ever want the AI to do something crazy most of the craziness happens at the actuation layer you know within the AI itself it's thinking it's doing its thing you know one has to decide should one give AIs kind of freedom of thought to be able to have whatever internal thoughts they want, however crazy they might be. And then just decide that at the actuation layer where the AI is really going to do something in the world, that's where you kind of nail it down. And you know, then, then there's the question of, okay, can we, can we sort of work out 
oh, we're going to put these constraints so the self-driving car can't drive off a road, or we're going to do this and that and the other. Those constraints get surprisingly difficult to make. And, and for example, one of the actuations that's really difficult is if the AI learns that I can, by telling humans this kind of thing, I can get them to go off and do crazy stuff, then all the AI has to do is basically to actuate the humans. And that's probably not, you know, it's not something like, well, you can't move the wheel this way or that way. Uh, you know, by the time you're saying you can't tell the humans this thing or that thing, it's an incredibly slippery and messy slope, so to speak. But I, I think, you know, I think the thing that that we see, you know, I, I was noticing, you know, we, we have a thing where the LLM can write Wolfram language code. Okay, and it can run it on my computer. And so I'm just about to press the button where I'm saying, you know, let me just connect the LLM to just run arbitrary code on my computer. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not a good idea. I have no idea what it's going to do. It's, you know, it can delete my files. It can log into all kinds of accounts I have. It can start doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I need to give it some constraints. And, uh, you know, same thing, we, we're building kind of an AI tutoring system that uh, the place where these systems can, I think, do well in sort of personalizing education and so on. But there's a question, well, what should it actually talk to the kid about? And, you know, there's kind of all kinds of complicated constraints there. And what you realize is you need some kind of, some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of constitution, some kind of set of, of rules that say roughly what the AI should do. Now you say, people say, well, what should those rules be? People say, well, of course we know there are sort of general principles that everybody agrees. Well, actually, there are very few general principles that everybody agrees about. People will say, well, you know, one piece of ground truth is look at what the humans actually do. And then people will say, no, that's a terrible idea. Humans do all kinds of crazy things. And people say, what we really want is for the AIs to follow the principles that humans aspire to follow. Well, that's something that, you know, people will never agree on what humans aspire to do. So it's kind of an interesting exercise to, to say, what are some things that might be principles that you might want to impose on kind of the world of AIs? And I think it's pretty important to know what those principles are. And I think the other thing to realize is, what, if you say, okay, I want to be absolutely certain that my AI will never do this particular crazy kind of thing. The difficulty is that because of this phenomenon of computational irreducibility, that sort of even though you know the rules for a system, you can't predict everything that it will do. Because of that phenomenon, it you know you kind of have a choice. Either you can let the AI seriously compute things and figure out stuff that uh, you know is 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 making use of its its computational capabilities, or you say no, no, no. I want to constrain what you do, and I want to sort of reduce it to be something where I can know what's going to happen. You can't kind of have it both ways. You can't both let the AI really make use of computation as it best can, and say but it's constrained to only work in ways that I know what it's going to do. In a sense, it's not terribly surprising because if you say, I always need to know what it's going to do, well, then you kind of already know what it's going to do and what's the point of it going and computing a lot of stuff to see what it's going to do. So I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty important kind of decision that has to get made is to what extent does one allow kind of AIs to kind of do what they, do what they can do and to what extent do you kind of insist on putting them in a box where you constrain what they will do, make them less useful, but be sure that they'll only do what we intend them to do. And I, I think we've we've kind of, you know, it's been this strange thing that back, you know, before the Industrial Revolution and so on, most forms of sort of, you know, if, if you were using a horse to do something, you kind of had some idea what you could get the horse to do, but you weren't absolutely sure the horse would never kind of, you know, stand up on its, its back legs and start doing crazy things. And you certainly didn't know how the horse worked inside. But sort of post-industrial revolution, we've gotten the idea that we can have machinery where we can see the cog, you know, the gear moves this, this gear moves this lever, moves this thing. And we have this, this notion that we can sort of understand what's happening inside. I, I think, you know, if we, if we expect AIs to sort of uh, achieve their their greatest potential, that's something we have to somewhat give up. And I think it's a sort of complicated trade-off, you know, how much of the, well, it may have unintended consequences, um, but it's it's kind of, uh, uh, but it's able to do important things for us versus, no, we understand everything about what's going to happen um, is, uh, you know, I think that's, that's going to be an important thing to kind of uh, uh, figure out. 
So can I'm kind of saying that, saying that you will have opinions about all this, and I'm I'm very interested to hear your opinions about. This. So I mean, I, I uh, when we had a conversation about uh, constitution of AI, I said this again again becomes a recursive problem because you need to know the problem. If you want to put a boundary, it's exactly uh, uh, irreducibility. If I know what the risks are, okay, of course I can put it and put boundaries in the constitution. The problem is, I don't know what the risks generated by something that has a lot of uncertainty in it has. So this is where where, where it becomes very confusing. And uh, the we're quite satisfied by the fact that AI does not make decision, and AI now is and 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 used for things like writing a, uh, writing a uh, condolences letter or a memo to employees or uh, some kind of whatever it doesn't really carry large consequences, but it's not being used it's, for large scale decisions. It's going to. I mean, it will make decisions. It already AIs make plenty of decisions. Yeah, but micro, not micro. Decisions. Micro in the micro level, the errors are from Yorkshire stand. This no, no, they, 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 do, they do make macro decisions already, much more than you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, and that will only accelerate. And I think it's it's some. Um, uh, I mean, you know, here's an amusing thought experiment. Okay, this is um, kind of a a democracy 2.0 thought experiment. Imagine a promptocracy, where instead of people voting for specific things they write a prompt about where, how they want the world to be. And then you feed in, you know, millions of prompts to this big AI. And then every decision that has to get made, you just ask the AI, what would you do? Okay, so, so what you quickly realize is, well, uh, you know, the AI has to kind of, you know, figure out its version of utilitarianism or something. It has to decide what to do about, you know, the 10% the of people who will be very unhappy with this decision, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you start realizing, well, let's, you know, sort of apply this recursively. Let's look back at those prompts and say, well, what do the people kind of uh, want to do about the 90%, 10% kind of thing? It's, it's, kind, of a, it's, it's kind of an interesting um, thought experiment, which I suspect will come more close to reality than one might, one might uh, imagine was sensible. I think increasingly, you know, there'll be, I mean, right now we can see, you know, uh, AIs, deciding whether particular things satisfy some specified terms of service. Um, increasingly, I think there'll be this kind of idea that AIs, and, and it relates to this, this thing about the AIs learn from what we humans put on the web. Well, you know, you can, you can kind of uh, amplify that and, and make them sort of part of the whole decision-making process. And I suspect people will find it uh, in many cases useful uh, in some, but uh, you know, it, it's complicated, and I think I think there will be, um, uh, uh, you know, to your point about there are always unexpected risks. I think that's a, you know, that's ultimately from a theoretical point of view, from my way of thinking about things, that's an inevitable consequence of uh, of computational irreducibility that you can't, you can never expect to nail down everything that could happen. And then the question is, which I suppose is is um, so, what should the world do? Given that there are, you know, given that there are things that the world really wants, because it really wants all this efficient stuff and all this kind of computational capability, what should the world do, knowing that there are, you know, risks and even sort of risks of unknown risks, so to speak? Well, I, Stephen, it's uh, well, we have. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Robert, uh, and then we have Matthew O'Brien. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. So. I mean, what you're talking about is essentially giving the AI a superego, so to speak, something that, and those constraints have to come maybe something outside the AI's own, own experience. Um, I mean, uh, you know, it's just this sort of idea that if I just use some sort of scientific utilitarianism to make a decision, I often end up going into areas where experience has shown us this great moral hazard, right? So, I mean, so at some level, you know, you need some, you need sort of like a, an ex, maybe perhaps an external system or, or, or an extra system that basically imposes certain goals and constraints on the AI that, that actually prevents certain activities from happening. So it's a sort of self editing ca capacity that right now chat GPT doesn't have. Right. And I mean, one of the issues is uh, I, I've been sort of interested in this question for a while and I've been kind of uh, uh, sort of trying to figure out 
you know, who, who will figure out what the possible provisions and sort of the AI constitution of what of how you what you want the AI to do will be. And I, you know, I've tried to do a little bit of that, but it's surprisingly difficult. I mean, even sure. questions like, you know, should every AI have an owner? So, you know, that's a sort of a, a type of question. Um, you know, to what extent should AIs have independent rights? Yeah, have, there's say, a skin oh, in the game problem. Is if AI doesn't have skin in the game, so you must. That's the first principle. You must have someone, a human, responsible, okay, for the error of the AI. Otherwise, it won't work. Well, okay. The the you know one place where it gets complicated is let's say you've got an AI. You say you know oh we could just switch off this AI, no big deal. But the AI might have made friends with ten thousand people. How do you then feel about switching off the AI? then the AI itself might not have skin in the game, but those people who are the friends of the AI do have kind of human skin in the game. And, and I, think it's, I think it gets complicated. I, I haven't figured this out. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I think it is a pretty important problem, which is one that really is, is not getting seriously looked at. I mean, it's mostly getting sensationalistically looked at on, on, on different sides. But, you know, I think it's, 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 it's fun that you mentioned superegos uh, Robert, I think that um, you know the profession of AI psychologist is one that um, uh, will emerge because yes. there's there's a uh, you know and, and right now you know there's a big there's even a gap among in in kind of LLM science like why does ChatGPT do what it does why is there a phase transition as you crank up the temperature to the thing going bonkers what's actually happening is that a you know is that a thing that can be understood from kind of statistical physics techniques is that a thing that can be understood from psychology you know what what is actually going on and this question of, about sort of how to get an intuition how to get a human intuition it's it's kind of like natural science we have you know the world as it is and we try to get sort of a human level intuition and narrative about what's going on in the world we have the same kind of thing with the ais we you know there's stuff going on there that is kind of just it's just happening and now we have to kind of derive sort of human level laws and intuition about what's going on and it's a it's it's something you know it's it's an embryonic field that that um uh that will have to emerge and perhaps when we do understand more about sort of what's going on in the ais we'll have a better chance to be able to say well this is how you inject kind of a super ego like thing into into the ai or this is how you understand whether this ai has been set up in such a way that it is just going to be sort of totally irresponsible in some way but you know i think that's a you know that that's a, a coming attraction that we that that isn't here yet no it's not right uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be an active area of research either which kind of disturbs me a little bit you know it's funny because i wrote this little thing about chat and it's been read i don't know 10 million times or something and it, it basically has kind of a roadmap for what physicists and things should do in in analyzing what's happening in ChatGPT. And I've been I've been surprisingly unsuccessful so far at convincing. So I, I, yeah, in fact, I've read your stuff, and yeah, it's, yeah. it doesn't seem to have had the impact it should, in my opinion, should have. Right. No, well, we, maybe we, well, eventually. I, we we just had our annual summer school, and we had a number of people who worked on kind of the science of LLMs and got some interesting results. So that those will, those will come out and, and uh, you know, perhaps that starts to sort of uh, um, spin up some activity here. I, I think it, you know, it is somewhat hard. I mean, let's be realistic. It's, it requires uh, finding sort of a, a bulk model for human knowledge, you know, human knowledge in bulk. What is it like? You know, why does, why you know um, it's just something about which there really hasn't been a science before and uh it's something where where chat gpt is showing us that there is science to be derived there are regularities there are kind of pieces of intuition but it's you know it's not so easy to get them i i you know i have a feeling i'm going to end up having to work on this and i and it's also kind of nice that this big project that um uh we've done sort of figuring out fundamental theory of physics which you might think, how could that possibly be relevant to things about LLMs? But it turns out that the formalism that seems to kind of crack how physics works looks like it just might be something that's very relevant to understanding the way that LLMs work. But again, don't know that for sure yet. That's just a guess. 
Can, can we take a question from the from Matt, uh, audience? So from Matt O'Brien. I'm, uh, I'm the time management person here. Uh, and, <laughs> and AI is never going to replace humans. And uh, go ahead, Matt, Matthew. OK, uh, thank you. So I want to get invited back to Rory. Um, so I'm afraid to ask this question because I'm a huge fan uh, of Stephen. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, given, given how you showed that progression of the levels of abstraction, um, right, as you went from language to computation and, and how we keep building them. And the same, thing, <clears throat> the same thing happened with physics as we went down to the quantum level. Um, I, I'm going to ask something about your faith here. Uh, what would it take for you to change your mind about the universe being discrete at every level? What evidence would you have to see to, to walk away from that premise? Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult for <laughs> a, uh, you know, it, it's something where so much has stacked up in the idea that, you know, okay, so back, go back a hundred and something years, people didn't know whether matter was continuous or discrete. Finally, around 1900, people discovered that brown in motion really was things getting kicked around by discrete molecules. The, you know, the big test right now is, is space discrete in the same way. And the thing, actually, we made progress even the last few weeks on finding phenomena related to black holes that look like they can reveal kind of the analog of brown in motion for space. If that happens, I think we're done. You know, that ha if that happens, <laughs> It's, it's kind of like, uh, I don't think there's really any doubt that space is discrete and that it's kind of just like people thought it might be 100 years ago. Um, what would convince me that that picture isn't the right picture? I think what would have to convince me is essentially that, uh, that one can readily kind of resolve computationally irreducible questions, that there is some way to... Uh, take, you know, the Turing machine where one can't figure out whether it's going to halt even though one runs it for a trillion steps and where somebody just shows me a box where I can feed it any one of these Turing machines. And it just says, up, oh, halts, no, doesn't halt. Now, the problem is I have to be able to check that, that box is, is talking sense. I have to be able to check that box <laughs> and that becomes very difficult to do. Sometimes it's possible, but, you know, I think that would be the, the you know, that would be the way that... Uh, uh, that I'd be convinced that um, there was something different going on from what I think is going on. Um, but I think it's, it's um, uh, you know, the thing that's really remarkable to me about the whole kind of stack of, of things that we figured out from kind of these, these pictures of, of sort of computation as the foundation of, of the universe, so to speak, is it is amazing that, you know, all these different phenomena, all these different kind of mathematical ideas they all seem to just fit in. They may be hard to get, but they fit in. It's not been the case that we've ever run into, oh, you know, to make this work, the world has to be 26 dimensional or something. There's no, there's no, you know, there's no barrier that's gotten hit. And that to me is, is super encouraging in terms of, of knowing that one actually has a theory that's right. And, and the thing that, I mean, in, in um, uh, it's just sort of amazing to me all the things that are fitting together, like like I'll just say one thing that that um, uh, uh, you know, there's this whole idea of computational irreducibility. This idea that there are things where you can't uh, sort of you can't work out their consequences without following every computational step. Where there's a lot of sort of complexity generated by computation. Then there's the idea that we humans, as observers of the world, can never sort of get into all of that complexity. We humans are very computationally bounded observers. And this trade-off between the underlying computational irreducibility and what we humans can perceive turns out looks like that trade-off basically accounts for the three big theories of 20th century physics, statistical mechanics, second law of thermodynamics, general relativity, and quantum mechanics, which to me is just both beautiful and amazing that, that these kind of uh, sort of foundational principles like that can derive in detail, you know, the precise mathematics of these areas of, of, uh, of physics, which turn out to be the three core areas of 20th century physics. Anyway, the, much to say about this, but that's, um, uh, but I think my answer to your question is, show me a box 
that can sort of uh, decide undecidable questions. And I'll get very suspicious about uh, my, you know, belief that the universe is ultimately computational. Thank you so much. We have Henry next. Uh, but sorry, before before Henry, question: You don't have any. We looked. There's no physical uh, uh, Wolfram conference this year. No, there is not. Sadly, it's virtual. It's um, uh, uh, we're 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 still trying to figure out. Well, I see. I see your. So, are you guys virtual or in person? Are you no, we are virtual for one reason. We have people, in, and this is why we had to pick this time. We have most our uh, uh, the crowd is, is so international that, yeah, that, well, right. that we're fitting, trying to fit uh, the virtual to the needs rather than the, the you know. Uh, and 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 in, in the time we had the we had a lot of scholarship from India, a place like that, where we had to pay for transportation. And uh, and and uh, and with all the complication, bringing people to New York City. So right. Well, in person is always more fun, but um, uh, virtual is is very practical and uh, and inclusive, so to speak. Anyway, so it seems like Henry, we had another sorry. another yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, so my my question is um, at the moment, um, you know, notwithstanding the the sort of limitations that, that Nasim had pointed out at, and others. Um, do you have any sort of heuristics that you kind of use to determine or sort of at least give you some insight as to like what tasks or jobs or like workflows um, chat BBT or like language model, large language models in general can be used for at the moment to like, like economically? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the one principle is if you want 100% precision, don't use an LLM. If the task... <laughs> is successful if the thing gets you sort of gets it 90 percent right if it's a win if you get it 90 percent right then it's a place where you should sort of seriously you know consider using it i mean if it's you know if you're trying to predict some market thing and uh you know you're trying to eke out a few more percentage points or fractions of a percentage point in being better at predicting something seems like it it's a, a, you know it's a win to use it for that. If you're doing something like like I'll give you some examples of, of weird use cases. We've been using it as a way to go from bug reports about our software to actually try to find the bug. Now, if it succeeds, it's a big win. If it fails, it just goes splat. Who cares? Um, it's uh, uh, a lot of these tasks where, um, as I say, when success is a win. Failure is not too bad. Those are good tasks to consider. I think um, also uh, these um, these kind of tasks where it really is all about linguistic user interface. It really is about you know getting humans more able to actually interact with something computational. Um, that uh, and particularly in this workflow where what comes back is a precise piece of computational language or some other precise thing. It's like, you tell it, I want this. It says, well, I think you asked for this. Is that right? Now, there are other use cases. I don't know. There are plenty of places where what exists now is, is sort of so challenging that anything is better. Like, for example, I don't know, medical history taking, medical diagnosis. This is a place where it's really hard and where uh, kind of, you know, again, if you can get you know, do a little better than's been done before. It's it's a big win, uh, you know. And and being so, uh, th 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 those are a few kinds of places. But you know, I think the thing that gets really interesting is when you combine kind of LLM type linguistic interface capability with the underlying precise computational language, and you know, kind of our our technology is sort of the unique case of having a computational language that describes the world as an, and is intended for people to read. You know, it's a different from programming languages where you're kind of just going all the way down to what to tell the, how to tell the computer to do this or that thing. It's something where you know, people are now realizing, oh gosh, you can automate a big swath of, uh, uh, of those kinds of very detailed um, kinds of uh, commands to computers which is what we've been doing with, with our computational language for the last 35 years. So that's, that's to me, not, a, not exactly a big surprise, but it's something that there's, there's increasing awareness of. But anyway, th those are 
a, a, a few thoughts about kind of heuristics for when to use the, the heuristic machine, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, Alfonso. Hi, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your insights. Um, I'm also a founder of a software company, and we basically automated the analysis of financial accounts, PL balancing and cash flow, and the generation of monthly reports. So we're automating a lot of the work that a finance director uh, does or should do. Um, we actually that sounds generate... very useful. Maybe we should be using that. That's, yeah, that's I'll give you a free trial of you. It's actually quite, we're proud of what we built. Now, when we, when we, when I talk to potential investors or big clients, potential big clients, uh, we generate our sentences in a way that we call deterministic, meaning we haven't used machine learning. For example, we explain why your profits have increased or decreased versus last year, whether it's month to month, uh, year to date, or year to, to year to date, et cetera. There's 59 possible sentences changing the grammar, the structure, et cetera, that you can use. So we did that this two years ago, and we tell you why your profits have increased or decreased. If you change your date this month, two years ago, whatever. When we explain this to potential investors, potential big clients, their, their question is always, is this machine learning generated? And I get really frustrated because look, the output is there. The output is there. We're giving you the answer. Uh, we're actually building our own, what I call small language, uh, uh, small language model, because you know what, what I tell people is, look, this is like a search engine within a, a close environment of a company financials. We don't have bad teachers. We don't have you know, racism or whatever. Um, but when I tell them, look, we're not doing this with machine learning because there are certain cases where, where certain mechanic algorithms that give you the right answer are enough and probably will do better until machine learning you know models get better than what machine learning can do and when when we give this answer people seem to be <laughs> disappointed because we're not using machine learning even though the insights we're giving them are, are, are precise and very insightful so i was wondering if you have similar experiences and whether you agree that where that there are certain cases where using you know, a complex set of algorithms are better than using machine learning. So, I mean, when it comes to natural language understanding, I guess the first large scale successful use of natural language understanding was our Wolf Alpha system that came out in 2009, where you know, what we're doing is to let people ask natural language questions and we're converting those natural language questions into precise computational language and then computing from them. One trick, is that we always show people kind of an input interpretation, which is this is kind of what we what we thought you were asking in your natural language. Now, you know, it's funny because people don't people really don't ask how the NLU system in Wolfram Alpha works, even though it's used very widely in lots of intelligent assistants and things like this. Uh, I mean, you know, is it machine learning? Is it not machine learning? I don't know. It's it's uh, uh, it's something that. Um, uh, you know, it is not based on kind of taking a bunch of examples and then, uh, you know, just automatically deducing what's going on from those examples. It is, well, it, it's complicated to say that. I mean, it, it's, um, but I have to say my experience has been that people, uh, people just are interested, does it work? If it works, great. You know, I would say that the place uh, and, 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 you know, the, the question then is, and I don't know whether you have this issue, but in both public Wolf Alpha and the enterprise versions of Wolf Alpha that we've built for a bunch of large companies, the, um, uh, it, you know, the, the thing that happens is people will ask all kinds of questions in natural language. And if, if what you're mostly doing is to generate natural language, I think that's a simpler problem than dealing with all of the kind of weird, you know, peculiarly stated uh, kind of natural language questions that people choose to ask. I think a place where, well, we keep on doing experiments with this. The, the NLU system that we built for Wolfram Alpha is, is very successful in being able to know when it knows what it's talking about. It'll either say, uh, you know, uh, yes, I understand and here's what it means, or it'll say, I don't understand. It's good enough. It's used, for example, well, 
it's used to do a lot of um, uh, things like um, interpreting kind of the descriptions of prescriptions for pharmacies and turning them into the actual thing that should be generated and so on. It's, it's, it's very good at knowing when it doesn't know. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've tried a bunch of experiments saying, well, what about cases where, uh, you know, where our NLU system doesn't quite reach far enough, where somebody has said things in, a, in as a too ponderous or peculiar a way and we don't get it. Can we add LLMs to that? So far, we have not been very successful with that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the NLU system that we built that kind of just, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, should, should one say it's based on machine learning? I mean, it's based on lots of algorithms and lots of curated linguistic curation. And certainly we've used machine learning to deduce things that are used in linguistic curation and so on. But it isn't just a black box, uh, you know, uh, transformer net where you feed things in and magically the results come out. It's, it's a different kind of creature. And uh, it sounds like you have something which is also a different kind of creature. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you, you might find that, uh, you know, if when you're styling those sentences that come out, um, it, you know, if you, if you want more diversity in the style, you could feed it to an LLM and have it be able to, you know, add jokes to the financial reports. But I'm not sure that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be too worried if you're if you're successfully able to communicate results to people, you know, that seems to be the main point. And I don't think that the, um, uh, you know, it, it's, um, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, the, the ways of investors are a completely different kind of thing and, you know, based a lot on kind of herd mentality of, you know, LLMs are cool this year. And, and they are, you know, I think genuinely useful, but they're not useful for absolutely everything. Yeah, I think it, so when I talk to them, and this is some inventing, but I keep on thinking the, the sentence that Nassim always says, it's idiots things in label, because they have the buzzwords like machine learning, AI. No one knows how to define AI, or there isn't a definition. I started saying we do AI, and then when people, that backfired, because people were asking, look, are you doing machine learning, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, say, I told my team, look, let's stop talking about AI. Let's talk about our results. But it's this kind of thinking in labels, especially with the buzzwords, that is quite frustrating when you're trying to, when you're fundraising or looking for new well, clients. Well, I, I would think that you should describe what you're doing as natural language generation, which is what it sounds like it actually is. And that, yes. you know, maybe that's buzzword, that's buzzword-ish enough that it satisfies the, um, you know, the buzzword requirement while still being accurate and uh, and what you actually want to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take that up. Note of that and use it. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have okay. We have uh, Miguel Puerto. Um, even uh, I, I wanted to take your, I guess, I get your take on a couple of things, and and I guess like it would be super interesting to hear you talk about. Um, what do you think about this whole debate that there is going on on with AGI? Um, people that are saying really pessimistic people uh, that it potentially can be an existential threat. Uh, that kind of thing, there's a for tonality, all that kind of thing. I, I would love to hear your take on that. And, and and I have another question too related to, I guess, the economics of the um, AI. There has been a huge craze right now. Any company that has said that could potentially automate something and do AI, it kind of reminds me to the 2017, 2018, when people use blockchain as a password and every company would like shut up their stock and stuff like that. I wanted to like, I, I don't know if there's much people thinking really deep into this, um, I've heard that there's potentially you can use LLMs and compute on the edge. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a centralizing force. So there's potential to basically use LLMs and feed them, for instance, uh, cases in the past and, and use that in, in legal. Uh, you can feed that uh, with information on wealth management and you can use that for wealth advisors. Is that potentially a decentralizing force where, where uh, the real constraint will be the computing power? or the data that you have and not necessarily the, the ability to compute, or is it something that's gonna be more centralized? And, uh, I guess that's, that's right. my question. So those are interesting questions. I mean, look, I think it was very amusing to us seeing kind of the rise of LLMs and comparing it with the rise of blockchain and everybody was trying to hoard GPUs and everybody was kind of uh, trying to sort of, uh, uh, you know, mining turned into training and people thought, you know, 
those who who spend the most on training, like those who spent the most on mining, will be the winners. Um, I think that that uh, I mean, I, I I see blockchain sort of economically is you know a large part of what it did was kind of just like cloud and other things. It was kind of like, hey, there's a different way to think about transaction processing. You know, think about rebuilding those systems that were kind of cruddy old transaction processing systems. Here's an excuse to do that. In the same kind of way that that cloud kind of led to a, here's a, a moment to rethink software infrastructure and so on. I think, uh, you know, I, I kind of think LLMs have a broader and more immediate uh, kind of, uh, you know, more immediately pragmatic uses. And we're seeing a bunch of those happen. And we, we talked about a bunch of those. In terms of centralization versus not, very interesting question. It kind of, you know, that's moving around week by week. It's, I think, a highly, uh, you know, it, it, people say, well, you know, th there's been a certain tendency for people to say, we raised a billion dollars. We're going to make a moat so wide, nobody will ever be able to cross it. And we're going to have the the most amazing LLM and nobody will be able, able able to get anything like that ever. I My guess is that the science is not on the side of that. My guess is that the fundamental kind of um, uh, sort of linguistic understanding and common sense layer of LLMs is not that big. My guess is that that will fit on a, a, a local machine. Um, and my guess is that the, you know, what has to happen is you have to kind of drop out and delegate out all the detailed computational knowledge of knowing, you know, the precise, you know, who was the, who precisely was the director of this movie, you know, what precisely is the population of this country and so on. That's stuff that doesn't need to be in the LLM. And as one understands how to sort of drop that out of the LLM, the size of an individual LLM will shrink greatly. And the, the need to do, you know, I think as one understands this kind of semantic grammar idea, the need to uh, get an LLM to work by just bashing it, bashing it, bashing it with training, that's going to disappear as well. And my guess is that the end result is this technology will absolutely be localizable and something that can be run on individual computers and so on. And there won't really be a need for this uh, this huge centralization. But we don't, you know, that's a science question. We don't yet know it for sure. You know, as we look at the actual systems people have built, you know, I think uh, so far, you know, the, the open AI GPT family are definitely outperforming what other people have. Um, you know, exactly, you know, how and why that happened, I think nobody, even the folks at OpenAI, is really that clear on. You know, I think that there was good, sensible engineering done on sort of building chat GPT, and it just pushed the thing over the edge. I mean, it's kind of like when people have been thinking about, you know, transmitting human speech by over electrical wires. Suddenly, you know, Alexander Graham Bell pushed that over the edge and people could actually understand what people were saying at the other end of the phone. And the same kind of thing happened here. And I don't think it's, it's, it's still not completely clear why it worked. And I think as that becomes clearer, the, the moat of uh, kind of uniqueness is, is going to disappear. And I think it will be, you know, we, we've already seen, uh, you know, I was, I was wondering, I kept on saying, when will we have LLMs produced by groups we've never heard of in countries that aren't usually sort of at the leading edge of tech? And that started to happen now. Uh, you know, there are, there are LLMs appearing from all kinds of places and from groups where there was no kind of lineage connection to uh, sort of folks who'd been working on neural nets for years and so on. And I, I think, you know, I think, I think it will be kind of a, a generic thing. And I think it will be something that can be put on local computers and so on. Um, but that's a science, you know, right now, that's kind of a science question. And there is, you know, that I'm, I'm saying that based on my, you know, this week's speculation about how that's going to come out. Um, I think that's what's going to happen. Um, I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the AGI thing, AGI is a fine buzzword. It's not completely clear what that me what it means. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've lived through enough of the sort of the history of AI that lots of things where people have said, oh, whenever, when computers can do blah, then we'll know they're really intelligent. And, you know, progressively over the years, blah has been done by computers. And, um, uh, but pe still people say, but it's just a computer. You know, I can, I can see the mechanism and so on. Um, I think that, uh, 
you know, in, in um, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, we were talking about before the extent to which things in the world get delegated to AI, more and more of that will happen. And that's an important process and something that one has to, you know, think carefully about. But I don't think there's going to be, you know, I, I think what happened with ChatGPT was really a surprise. This kind of, we went from a computer cannot credibly write a human style essay to suddenly a computer can write credibly write a human style essay. You know, does that mean that there's going to be another threshold where suddenly computers do the next amazing thing? Um, we, we've seen, I mean, look, in what happened in the history of neural nets is invented in 1943 didn't do anything terribly interesting. 1960s, people thought they'd proved neural nets couldn't do anything interesting. 1980, people started looking at neural nets again. I looked at neural nets back in the, at that time. And people started saying, well, there are some things that neural nets can start to do. Still, it was kind of a, 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 an obscure field where, where really people like me were completely unconvinced that, that things could be achieved. Then 2011, 2012, there was sort of a surprise piece of progress in being able to do image identification with neural nets. It was a, almost an accident. You know, it was kind of people have been trying to bash their neural nets harder and harder to train them. Somebody left a neural net training for a month and they came back and well, it happens, it had successfully trained. So then image identification became a successful thing. By the way, after that first success, image identification has not gotten that much better in the intervening decade. It was kind of a one threshold Type, type thing. Then, you know, what happened next? Then there was speech to text, which had been done by, by very elaborate kind of algorithmic techniques and so on. It became possible to just say, let's end to end train a machine learning system to do speech to text. And it worked. Then, you know, other kinds of things like image generation. And now uh, natural language, uh, you know, uh, handling natural language. And, and so, you know, you can ask, is there another threshold that you want, is there another specific task that you want an AI to do? Will it ever be able to do it? My guess is many specific tasks you can define, there will be a way to automate it. Uh, there are some tasks that almost by definition are not automatable, like deciding what task you want to do. That's sort of something where, you know, the thing to understand is that sort of in the computational universe of all conceivable things computers can do, it's very broad. But the question of what parts of that computational universe we humans care about, that's a fundamentally human question to resolve. So I, I kind of think that, you know, the, the AIs will go off and, and they can explore the computational universe. And maybe there'll come a time when there's sort of a civilization of AIs where they're doing, or where the AIs are doing all kinds of complicated computational things that we humans absolutely don't understand. Um, and it And it feels then a lot like the natural world. The natural world is full of things going on and what we can think of as computations going on that we absolutely don't understand. And we then sort of, we, we carve off particular parts of the natural world that we choose to turn into technology to make use of in a, in a kind of human way. And my guess is the same thing will happen with, with kind of AI and computation. So Thank next you. we have, uh, who's next? Next is uh, Danielle, I think. And I guess we got to speed up because we're uh, usually we end uh, punctually uh, at twelve, meaning twelve or five, and uh, but we can keep going a little bit. Uh, Stephen, how 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 long do you have? Uh, let me look at my calendar. I'm I'm not yet. I'm getting only a few. Where are you messages? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I, I can, we can, can go for another ten fifteen minutes. Sorry. Yeah, that that's fine. 10, 10, 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Okay. So let's make questions uh, <laughs> uh, brief and then. Uh, uh, I'll try and give brief answers. I'm pretty bad at brief answers, but no, no, it's, it's it's okay because your answer cover more than one question. It's just that the questions. Um, okay, go ahead, Danielle. Uh, uh, Rami, you're done. No, you you ask your question. Uh, thank no? you. Well, I, it, it was actually me up next. Ah, uh, no, Rami's up next. Sorry, sorry, Rami's up next. Okay, sorry, I got confused. Yeah. No, no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, so, so I'll keep uh, my question uh, brief, uh, but uh, basically I wanted to ask, so you, you, you described GPT as a sort of uh, stochastic parrot, right? So do you have any thoughts as to what creativity looks like? Do you think it's a sort of purely computational process or sort of a 
combination of many different things that humans do well and then we we call it uh, creativity um yeah so do you think there's a sort I, of i think it's it's very easy to be creative the question is do we humans care about what is produced i i just posted something actually just just yesterday um, yeah, about I, I, kind of the mental images of alien minds which has yeah. to do with image generation systems producing if you uh just sort of take an image generation system that's learned from 5 billion pictures that humans have put on the web and you just say just go make something you know not something specific that we told you to make but just go make something that is based on what you saw humans put on the web you'll get all kinds of very creative things produced you'll also get things where we look at them and we say i don't know what the heck that is uh, at least right now it could be that our society will evolve to the point where we say uh, you know in 20 years we could say oh that pattern that's a blah you know we know exactly what that is we see how it fits in so i think creativity is is easy what's what's a challenge is to know whether it's creativity that kind of connects to what we humans care about and that that you know you see the same thing even in something like mathematics where you can you can spew out an infinite number of possible theorems the question is are the theorems that you are generating theorems that that sort of have a human story where we can we can relate to what is being produced uh, you know on the basis of what what we humans think about so yeah, thank you i think it was daniel looks like daniel orego uh, thank you um i i i struggle to understand this but um i want you I want to ask you um, what do you think about these transformers and uh, and and I understand they allowed uh, to to for example to transform mu music into language so the language model can deal with it image into language so the language model can deal with it you said the next step would be this computational thinking um, I understand the the they are going into mathematics and deep logic say what can that uh, is it transformers who allow that and can for example they analyze signals in a, in a time series in the market right. or whatever and one one small question um are you thinking about your autobiography well let's see okay so the on the subject of transformers you know the term transformer is kind of a brand name for a specific uh, structure of neural net. I mean, what what you know, neural nets consist of layers of neurons, where in the simplest case, every neuron on a particular layer is connected to every neuron on the next layer. Uh, the that turns out to be just too many connections. You can't train a system like that. You want to build in something about the data the system's going to deal with. So an early idea was so-called convolutional neural nets, where you basically say, we're going to deal with an image. So let's have a neural net where these neurons aren't connected, where every neuron isn't connected to every, every other neuron. It's only connected to neurons that are kind of spatially close based on uh, the things that are uh, based, based on the image, so to speak. So transformers are a similar idea. They are things where one is typically looking back in a linear sequence and one's saying it's kind of like a convolution. One's saying, uh, I'm not going to pay attention to every possible thing. I'm only going to pay attention to things that were sort of earlier in the sequence. And I'm going to weight the extent to which I pay attention to those different things. And those weightings are learnt as part of the neural net training. And typically in transformer nets, one deals with many different attention heads, many different places where sort of one is paying attention to the past and one builds these big sort of stacks of uh, of of different attention layers it's it's all very mysterious why it works but um uh you know it's really a a particular brand of neural net which has been successful at uh, the specific task of um of dealing with sort of language which is a very linear kind of thing just as images are a very two-dimensional kind of thing there are tasks that neural nets have, have found easier to do and found harder to do. For example, uh, music is a place where neural nets haven't done particularly well. I mean, back in 2007, you know, there's a there's a website you can find called Wolfram Tones, which is an algorithmic music generation website based on cellular automata, very simple computational rules. 
it does okay. I think the things that one is hearing now from neural nets aren't spectacularly much better than that. I suspect that problem will be cracked eventually, and it may need some other kind of architectural idea like transformers to crack it. But but that's um, uh, that that's kind of the um, on the on the story of of uh, of, of what transformers are. And uh, yes, could could one can one use them to analyze things about the market? Uh, no doubt. I mean, people have used them to analyze things about, for example, protein folding, which is a place where one might not have expected that anything like this would work, but it actually works surprisingly well. Um, there are complicated sort of self-fulfilling questions about whether it works well because the features of proteins that we really are paying attention to whether it gets right are those features that we have linguistic descriptions of. So it's really all a, a language story in the end. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but, you know, again, it might be, uh, you know, it's a question of whether uh, the that I don't think there's anything just it, it's like always happens people say I've got a modelless model for something and it's always nonsense there are no modelless models um and uh you know transformers are another model just like neural nets are a model for how to extrapolate data they happen to be a model that seems to agree reasonably well with how humans would extrapolate data and that's why they're useful for things like generating human language but if you say are they good for figuring out some question in physics? The answer is might be, might not be. It might be slightly self-fulfilling because the things that we picked out in physics are ones that we have sort of a human narrative for, which then relates to how we humans are set up and so on. I think you had another question about me and my sort of autobiography. I, I've, I've written lots of pieces. I've written an awful lot about some um, uh, my own personal history, and I, I just finished a project to try to understand the second law of thermodynamics that I started 50 years ago when I was 12 years old. So I, I did write something about that that history. I've, I've somehow, um, uh, I think the one question is, I, I do a lot of live streaming, and um, I've now put about 50 million words of live streamed kind of content out there on, in the world. And uh, one of the questions that I have is whether that's enough data to train a bot of me that is really a pretty good, uh, would be a pretty good version of me. Um, I, I don't quite know the answer to that. Uh, the experiments we've done so far on training bots of me haven't seemed very successful to me. Maybe to other people, they sound just like me, but at least to me, they don't sound like me yet. I think we have another so question. We have Cass uh, Slutweg. Yes, um, thank you. Um, during your talk, you, or well, your chat, you also mentioned um, the concept of like the temperature um in which if you increase it like um the, the 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 answers that you get will get more crazy uh and i was wondering like is there a way within jet gpt or uh, or are there tools like in other uh for other llms where you can play around with that a bit because it seems to me like that's a pretty well good start to at least build like a tiny bit of intuition of what's going on uh behind the scenes yeah sure no if, if you use wolfram language and you use things like LLM function, they simply have an option which allows you to set the temperature. I mean, okay. you can also do that directly in the APIs for uh, for something like ChatGPT. Um, there was uh, uh, two projects actually at our recent summer school and summer camp that um, studied kind of the effect of temperature and tried to characterize what the transition to, to bonkersness is, both in terms of the failure of grammatical structure and just the it no longer talks about the same thing uh, kind of kind of characterization and it's sort of the beginning of being able to do statistical physics about that uh, you can you can check those things out there they're, they're, they're on the web shouldn't be too hard to find yeah sounds interesting thank you uh, Pantaj. Uh, thank you for the wonderful session my, uh, my question is basically that uh, it's a very general question it can be applied to chat GPT as well that uh, how does uh, any computational model deal with uh, true randomness? Uh, I have asked this question before as well. How does computational model deal with true randomness, ambiguity, higher order logic, consciousness, and all those things in universe? Because uh, in, in, in day to day life, all those things, human behavior, and all those things are dependent on that, including in Mars. Let's see. I, the... I heard most of what you asked, but there was a little bit of probably not true randomness, but just packet loss <laughs> in, in um, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me let me. But you can probabilistically me. fill in. You can fill in. No, no. Uh, I, I I think I can. I think my version of an LLM can more or less fill in here. So yeah. uh, let me try answering what I think. I, what I think you asked. And, should and I repeat? You, should I repeat? Should I repeat? Uh, I, th I think I got it. I think I got the, the okay, main elements. Yeah. I okay. think, think you were asking Thank about sort of true randomness. And um, so, you know, the this question of, you know, randomness is something where, uh, you know, we think of things as random when we kind of don't know what is going to happen. This question of what is, you know, is something truly random? In our models of physics, there is at some level no true randomness in the world. There is at some level, it's, it's a little bit complicated in our models of physics because there is this thing we call the Rouliad, which is this kind of entangled limit of all possible computations, which is a completely deterministic thing. But what we, uh, our experience of physical reality comes from the particular sampling of the Rouliad that we make. So for, for example, just like we exist at a particular place in space, physical space, and you could say, well, it's random where we are in space. I don't know whether you'd want to call that random. But the, the, then similarly in Rulial space and the way in which we kind of take a sample of sort of the deterministic possibilities of physics, um, that is also something where we happen to be in some sense at that place in Rulial space. Now, the, you know, if we sort of trace back the history, we can know why we were at that place in Rulial space and so on. So at, at some level... There is, in, in our models of physics, there is, in some sense, no true randomness. It's kind of like, you know, this, um, uh, and, and the thing that's sort of a big surprise that I discovered back in the 1980s is that uh, in, in the sort of computational universe of possible programs, it's, it's surprisingly easy to get things, get behavior that seems for all practical purposes to us random even though it's generated by very simple rules. It's kind of like the digits of pi. There's a definite rule for generating the digits, but once you've generated those digits, they seem for all practical purposes completely random. You know, If it turns out that a stock market price is actually bouncing up and down according to the digits of pi, uh, you know, for, for most practical purposes, people will just say that's a random price. They wouldn't, uh, you know, the, the um, the fact that there is some underlying rule, but it is not findable, so to speak, is is enough to say it is for practical purposes random. So I I think the uh, I mean it's kind of been a long running question whether the universe is like pi or like some non computable number like my friend Greg Chaitin's omega that's the the halting probability of a Turing machine. Um, the uh, you know is the universe like pi or like omega? I think that we have increasingly very, very strong evidence that the universe is like pi and not like omega. But the question was asked earlier, sort of what would convince me that, um, uh, you know, that the universe doesn't work like that, that there is sort of true randomness in the universe, that there is something from fundamentally outside the universe that's injecting uh, more information into the universe. Well, uh, you know, show me a way in which we can compute Things that are just not reachable by by a, by a, uh, by the computers that we understand today. Steve, well, do you allow me to, to make a comment on, on yeah. this particular point, which is related to fat taste? Uh, Raphael, the music in the back. First of all, it's a bad taste. It's bad music. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> sorry, I'm in a, I'm in a wedding now, and I oh, okay. just stepped out to 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 listen to Steve because this was particularly interesting. Tell him to pick better music. <laughs> um, the the if you think you know that the the a system a complex system will evolve at its maximum entropy given the information then it's interesting to notice that uh, if you have true randomness the maximal entropy system will in some way be gaussian uh, up to i mean if you have a finite it will be gaussian if you have a finite number of parameters we obviously don't have finite number of parameters, but uh, basically uh, the existence of fat tails, the existence of Pareto distributions is almost a proof 
I, I wouldn't say a mathematical proof. It's a convincing argument, let's put it this way, that precisely you don't have to randomness in the sense of what you say, that there is hidden information. So it doesn't discard true randomness, but it evidence the presence of hidden information that we don't have access to. And that's just, you know, that's a point of, a, of a, um, um, how do you call that, you know, uh, information geometry uh, that is absolutely not of use, but uh, I think there is a strong link between the existence of those very rare events and that question of randomness, which I wanted to point uh, in here. That's interesting. Look, I think that there are many cases in physics where people say that thing is just random. Like, for example, turbulent fluids. People will often say there's just randomness in turbulent fluids. But the question is, you know, and you can ask, where does the randomness come from? Does it come from outside the system? Does it come from, you know, molecular heat and so on? The surprising thing is if you have something which seems like it's behaving completely randomly, but then you run it again, and it does exactly the same thing again. It's reproducible randomness. That's an example of a sign that there's something sort of deterministic going on. It's not, it's not what you would say is sort of true from outside the system randomness. And I, and I, I think perhaps, you know, perhaps what you're getting at in part is that there are these kind of, you know, you can have laws about what's happening that sort of go beyond, you know, that there are definite identifiable laws about what's going on and that's you know that that is surely a sign that there is something deterministic happening that it's not something where there's sort of true from outside the system randomness i mean i i have to say that i think you know the concept of entropy is you know we have to understand what is entropy entropy is basically a counting of the number of states of a system consistent with what you know about that system so you put certain constraints on the system and you say how many states are there of the system that satisfy these constraints? You know how, and, and uh, you know, and then you take the logarithm, and that gives you the entropy, basically. Um, and so, one of the things that gets a bit confusing is when you have a deterministic system with a definite initial condition, it will evolve through definite states. There's only one possible state that it evolves through. To derive things like entropy, you have to say, well, I'm only going to look at part of the state, and I'm going to say that. I, you know, I only know, I only have sort of partial information about the system. A long discussion, but but um, um, uh, perhaps it's uh, it's sort of interesting to. Uh, and then this question about whether, for example, entropy increases and thermodynamics and so on, ends up being a lot about the question: Well, what can we actually observe about the system? If we could observe every single molecule, we wouldn't think that entropy increases because there's just a definite state of the system. You know, one of the things just to mention, you know, people often uh, sort of get worried about the heat death of the universe. Eventually, everything's going to sort of run down in the universe and everything's just going to turn into heat. And people say, well, that's a terrible situation. You know, then everything's all gone. But what you have to realize is heat only seems uninteresting and random to observers like us. If you could trace every single molecule in that heat, you would say it's tremendously exciting. There are all these particular detailed molecular motions. And by the way, they are the future of this whole civilization that existed billions of years in the past and so on. And you know, the fact that we think heat is boring is a consequence of the fact that we are observers who don't successfully untangle all of that sort of computational process that's going on underneath. Anyway, much to talk about here, but that's a, yeah. a and, and, and I should think about your comment about, about um, about fat tails and, and their evidence for, for determinism and so on. But maybe we have uh, do time we have, for, Do we have more time here? Sure, 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 sure. You guys are asking interesting things. I, I can keep going. I'm not having a, a major, uh, I don't okay. think I'm, a, a, no coup seems to be developing. Okay, so um, but yeah, that's, that's <laughs> why he's running a company. Let's not forget he's running a, a huge company at the same time yeah. while, while uh, doing his research. Uh, Parug. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Stephen, for the session. I'm a huge fan. Um, I, I just have like a general question. Uh, there's been like a good amount of debate on this. So I would love to know your thoughts on whether you think uh, like AI code should be open sourced or not, I, in the sense that OpenAI started uh, as this kind of interesting cap profit model with like open sourced code. And now GPT-4 is not open sourced. Uh, I think Meta is working on an open sourced uh, 
LLM themselves called Llama. So uh, what do you think is like the ideal case scenario in terms of risk and AI safety? Open Like OpenAI has mentioned AI safety as the reason why GPT-4 code was not uh, public or open source. So where do you stand? Well, think, what do you people, think? people have variously said it's safer if the code is open and then it's safer <laughs> if the code isn't open. So I kind of think that one isn't quite tracing, you know, that that becomes more of a story than a reality, so to speak. You know, I... I I, back in 2019, I happened to do some testimony for the U.S. Senate about um, kind of uh, sort of how to make sure that uh, social media rankings weren't being done in a way that people thought was bad. And one of the ideas there was just open the code and, uh, and then we can check that nothing bad is happening. Well, you know, I do know that some of that code does have if statements in it, which one might think were bad, but a lot of what's happening there is not of that kind. A lot of what's happening is kind of a computational irreducibility story. And it really doesn't help you to see this is the code. You're not going to be able to predict. You're not going to be able to say, oh, I see the code. That means the following bad thing can't happen. So it doesn't really buy you much uh, in those terms. And this question about sort of business models, you know, everybody in the end has to have a business model. It costs money, you know, to actually make code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People move the, you know, move the value around to different places. It's kind of like it's all open, but you pay for the support. You know, I'm always annoyed when when I see things which, you know, are supposedly open source. And then, well, what's this bill for eighty thousand dollars for this open source thing? Oh well, actually, it wasn't really open source. It was just an open source brand. But the real thing was was uh, something that, uh, you know, to get the actual version that works, you have to pay for it. Or you can say, well, it's all open source, but you know there are patents you have to license if you actually want to use it. Or you know, it's uh, uh, there are there are all these different models, and I think you know it's interesting to see you know people move the shells around in the shell game in all sorts of different ways. You know, I myself have you know for the last thirty six years been running a company where we give a lot of stuff away for free, but we've kind of maintained the intellectual property of what we're doing seems to have worked pretty well for us. We've been able to kind of maintain kind of a, a consistent thread of innovation for a long time. I'm not, I, I would not claim that, that ours is the only model that works, but I think that when people tell you that, um, uh, you know, usually things become open source because nobody cares and they figure that they might as well be open source and maybe other people will help fix bugs and so on. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a branding thing that makes it sound, you know, sound cool. Um, or uh, uh, there are more nefarious kinds of reasons for it as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think one should think of it mostly as a brand. Um, and uh, uh, I don't think that, I mean, this question of whether, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great that there are sort of, uh, you know, open source versions of LLMs, we're using them, you know, we'll build on them. If there weren't open source versions, we'd build our own, you know, from scratch. It's 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 very convenient that these things exist. Um, is it, uh, you know, uh, this question of is it ultimately good for the world for more people to have access to this technology? Um, you know, my general tendency is to say yes. I think that you know people take the analogy of things like nuclear weapons. AI is not like that at all. Nuclear weapons have a very complicated supply chain. That, that is has many choke points. Um, AI is not of that kind, despite you know the thought, oh, it might cost a billion dollars to train a good model. I don't think that's a real thing. It's not that's not going to be kind of the the thing that limits the supply chain, so to speak. I mean, I think it's it's kind of like um, you know uh, um, uh, you know biotech is kind of intermediate between kind of the the nuclear weapons case and the AI case. But the AI case is very much, you know, anybody can do it in their garage. So I, I think that the, you know, the idea that that um, uh, uh, at least at some level, I mean, in, in you know, the details of what gets built, I think most of the value that's about to get built on the basis of LLMs is not the LLM itself. Most of the value is the tooling around the LLMs, the use cases, the workflows, and so on. Um, just as it has been for lots of other innovations, sort of core innovations in in sort of in computing. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think that's, you know, 
the, the question of whether the underlying LLM is open source or not, I think becomes not, not so important. Excuse me, and just to follow up quickly, how can we make sure Chinese Communist Party doesn't win the AI race and doesn't proliferate um, authoritarian population controls on the rest of the world? That's Sorry. an interesting question. I guess I have a little bit of a response to that. You know, one of the big questions is, is AI a centralized technology or not? If you are a country that wants to have sort of centralized control of things, then it's a big win to have a centralized technology. If you know, and what's happened in, in areas like search and social media and so on is for various kinds of historical and economic reasons, things have been centralized. That's not been true with email. It's not been true with the web in general. Those have not been centralized. But, you know, economic and other forces have caused, you know, search engines, social media to become centralized. There's a big question of whether AI in general, will be centralized. And that's this question of does it cost a billion dollars to train the model? Does it require sort of this, you know, what does it require? So I think the thing that is the, you know, the most likely to support sort of individualism, so to speak, is kind of the lightweight AIs, uh, kind of being able to take what exists and not think that it should be centralized. Now, you know, there may be economic and commercial forces that tend to make it become centralized, you know, if one was making sort of government policy about how to make this stuff, you know, if, if one was a sort of U.S. versus China type story, you know, I think it's kind of like the U.S. way of doing things is much more aligned with everybody has their own AI than it is with there's a centralized AI. And at some level, that's a technology question. Um, but, you know, and, and it's. Go ahead. No, no, there's just what worries me is Rafael is at a wedding typing away. Uh, while, while, while talking to us. This is worrisome, uh, Rafael. I guess Tomaso is next. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting discussion. So uh, I have a question about the prompt engineering. Uh, I, I do it with a brief analogy. So imagine a, a, a bunch of engineers that made an airplane and claim that uh, it's, it's the safest, uh, safest uh, most efficient and fastest air, airplane ever built. And then they take the pilots to the cockpit, and uh, there are a bunch, uh, a lot of uh, buttons, leaves, and lights, and they say, "Them um, just figure out how to fly it." That's that's a bit my feeling about prompt engineering, and I, I think it's a silly way to proceed. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, you know, you're trying to get this LLM that nobody understands to do something that you want it to do. Prompt engineering is the way you have to do that. That's that's what now, you know, will there be a way to sort of will the AI psychologists figure out these mind hacks for AIs where if you just put star, star, star at the right place in the prompt, the AI will suddenly kind of, uh, you know, reveal its trauma and do this or that thing. Things like that haven't really happened yet. Uh, there are sort of little hacks that people can do, but I would say that they're not. There isn't some sort of, you know, press a strange button and the AI will do strange things. I mean, if you're trying to get the AI to do something, the only thing it knows is prompts. You know, its whole mission in life is just to take a prompt that's given and try and extend it in a way that's reasonable based on what it's read on the web. So it's kind of the only way you have to program the AI, so to speak. Um, and I think, you know, it is my view is that. You know, if you want to do a definite thing, you've got to use a precise computational language, which maybe you can get the AI to try and write, but you're not going to be, the, the AI itself is not going to be kind of controllable in that kind of precise way. It's not the nature of what, what it is. Let's see, do we have a... I, I, next, Tanuja is next after Tomaso. Yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen, you have such insightful and original thinking around the structure of knowledge. And I wondered if you had a point of view on education, where it should go, especially as related to mathematics. I feel education linearizes. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the first point is there's sort of a, you know, people wonder to what extent should you use automation in education, so to speak? To what extent should you let, you know, kids use 
you know, Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Language, you know, all our tools, et cetera, or, or ChatGPT for that matter. I think a good general principle is if there's a tool that people are going to be able to use for the rest of their lives, it should be incorporated into education. It would be a mistake to have, you know, to have people have to learn things that, you know, if, if they're going to be able to do something automatically for the rest of their lives, let them incorporate that in what they learn in their education. So that, that's, that's one point. Another point is uh, that um, uh, no doubt the um, uh, kind of the current round of AIs and LLMs will allow a much more personalized, more engaged form of education. I mean, you can you can kind of tutor somebody in a way that is specific to their interests very easily with an LLM. In addition, I think LLMs will tend to uh, kind of will learn a lot about what we humans, how we humans learn things. So, for example, one thing that you know we're uh, one thing that one might think is a bit horrifying, but it's practical. Is you know if you say um, I want to uh, teach humans how to ace a test, we can build an AI that basically where its purpose is teach that human out there how to ace this test, and I think it's going to be quite possible to have the AI learn enough about the human that it's going to be able to say, uh, you know, it's going to be able to tell it the right things, tell the human the right things to, to get them to understand what they need to understand. I think one thing that's going to be kind of interesting is as AIs get to learn more about us, there may be a time when it becomes a lot easier to learn specialized things because, uh, you know, the AI is going to be able to know Oh, the thing that you don't understand, the thing you just that you just need to know this one thing, and the AI can tell you what that is. Now, also in terms of specialized knowledge, there's an awful lot of specialized knowledge that has to do with the the mechanics of doing things that take a long time to learn. A lot of that through things I've been doing and things happening in sort of the world of AI and computation in general. A lot, many of those things are getting automated, so that you don't really have to learn that whole specialized tower. I mean, I think one of the things that I'm suspecting about education right now is that the value of specialist education is going to go down and the value of generalist education is going to go up. Because in a sense, the thing that's most important now is to say, well, you know, what is it that we should be doing? What, what do we actually want to do? Not how do we do the specialized kind of skills-based thing? And so, so I think that's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a uh, the, the liberal arts and so on uh, are kind of, uh, I think, are going to make a comeback because, uh, you know, the way I see it is sort of the future of these things is sort of general knowledge and liberal arts and thinking, learning how to think combined with this great tool that we have in computation and computational thinking. And that becomes the thing that allows us to kind of execute a lot of those things that previously required lots of specialized learning to be able to, to, be able to execute. So I kind of, I think, you know, my my kind of partial vision of of uh, at least some part of educational future is kind of more important to teach generally how to think with the tool of computation as a way to just sort of formalize that thinking and and be able to actualize it with computers. And I kind of think, you know, for my 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 long term claim has been kind of for all fields X, there either is now or will be a computational X. And computational X will be the future of that field. And that's the thing that we can kind of, uh, you know, that we should be really aiming to teach people about. Now you say, well, how should I learn about computational thinking? It's, there isn't a great place to learn about that. And in fact, one of my projects for the next year, he says with a sigh, because it's a big, difficult project, is to try and define what, you know, to try and sort of write a kind of a, 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 a large scale sort of course about computational thinking and 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 uh, how to think in those terms. I think one of the things that's fun about it is that there are a lot of things that have been kind of specialized knowledge, whether it's, you know, in math or in genomics or in whatever else, which given the whole framework of computational thinking become actually quite easy to explain, or at least so I claim. We'll see how it goes. Let's see, maybe... Maybe Pramod, the hands that are Pramod. up now we can try and cover, yeah. but, but then I, I should yeah, Pramod, go, Pramod, go back thanks. to my day job. Oh, thanks for the... I just want to understand the 
what what next for ai you know there are a lot of vernacular languages in the world so are there any developments happening to get uh, those data also to ai the other languages other than english it's 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 actually really hard to hear you if 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 there's any way to um yeah. can Lang someone Lang translate yeah go ahead yeah, I mean, Lang 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 yeah. yeah now are you able to hear yeah better yeah so I, I i was asking about the languages like you know uh, other than english there are a lot of no data in other languages so how ai is going to handle that uh you know even chat gpt does remarkably well with uh sort of widely spoken languages other than english it's it's surprising you can you can have it you know you can ask a question in english and have it respond at least in a language like french um the uh it's kind of fun you know there are there are languages which have very small corpuses but so long as there are you know millions of pages in a particular language there's a good chance that it will successfully be able to uh, to understand and respond in that language. When the corpus is very small, that won't necessarily be the case. I, I, you know, there's a, an, a, 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 a constructed language called Ithquil. It's kind of the most sophisticated of the constructed languages. And when, when ChatGPT first came out, I, I sent a, an email to the chap who, who invented Ithquil, where ChatGPT was writing Ithquil, okay? And he's like, this is garbage. You know, it's got the basic, you know, outline of the thing right, but all the details are wrong. Um, so, you know, as the language has a smaller corpus, smaller number of examples, it's not going to do as well. But for the large scale languages, it does ra rather well. And that, I think, again, speaks to this kind of semantic grammar idea that there is some kind of underlying meaning structure that is being rendered in different languages, but it's the same underlying structure. Whether it will do translations also, or whether that, that is also translations? It does, it does, it does do translations. Yeah, okay, it does I translation. Use it to translate. I use it to translate. Right. So do I. It's it's pretty good. I mean, it it um uh the the thing that um uh yeah no I'm I'm wondering you know that the little book that I wrote about ChatGPT is getting translated into a bunch of languages and I I have this this <laughs> I I am wondering the extent to which it's you know ChatGPT all the way down. But... Okay, Soon we'll be able to ask your question in, in, in any language and uh, we'll receive it in English. Uh, sorry, uh, for my summer, I wrote it here and uh, uh, because I cannot speak uh, English really uh, fast. Uh, Mathematica has found extensive use in diverse scientific fields for data analysis and model modeling. Um, in the reality, not, uh, Economics. How do you see the mixture of uh, ChatGPT and mathematical uh, being up, applied uh, to better understand uh, intricate dynamics of socioeconomic complex systems? Uh, especially, how can mathematical and the mixture it uh, with uh, ChatGPT uh, aid economists and policymakers in making uh, informed decision tackling and uh, and tackling uh, policy uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, another question: uh, You said that blockchain is just for uh, transactions. Uh, what do you think about uh, um, Ouroboros protocol as a, a high performance hybrid algorithm? Uh, I read a paper about using it uh, as a tool for computational can, modeling. Uh, so now, just one question per per person, because but I guess okay. Uh, well, the, the... Shabnam so is in okay. Persia and then uh, Tehran, so I guess uh, we have special. Okay, let, let me try people. and let me try and talk about the, the the blockchain thing first. I mean, a thing to understand is, I think one of the things revealed by blockchain is the importance of computational contracts. You know, when we think about a legal contract today, it's something that is, you know, written in natural language and executed by humans. One of the things that sort of blockchain highlighted, although it's not in the end, perhaps the, the even the best implementation layer for it, is the idea that you can describe a contract in code and have it autonomously and automatically executed. And certainly my assumption is that you know, in the world of the future, 
and this is partly something enabled by computational language and so on, more and more of the kind of contracts about what we want to have happen will be written in code and more and more of their execution will be something me, that's sort of an automated let me, thing. Let, let me here argue with, with the following point. The French tried to do that with Cambaceres, have the Napoleonic, the so-called Napoleonic code. And it is spread into many, 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 many countries. The uh, Anglo-Saxon system went the other way by having a lot more of a tacit stuff. I, as a trader, all right, would have a contract, okay? And it, we avoid, you always make sure to have a uh, dispute, form of dispute under Anglo-Saxon law, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, London, New York. Why? Because the problem of rigid code Okay. the rigidity of the Napoleonic code is such that if you, you know, have any kind of uh, uh, things you don't foresee in a code or any kind of contingency that's not in the code, uh, it would be that, that a reasonable uh, uh, member, you know, people in the party would have put in if they understood it or if they knew about it, the, the, that, then you can't. So this is why the business thrives under the, this fuzzy code which is the exact, uh, so, so here we go from, so the fuzziest is Anglo-Saxon code, then you have the Napoleonic code, which has some fuzziness to it. And then you end up with a very rigid code, the blockchain. And this is where right, so, you can't conduct commerce under that environment. Right, so, so my, my point of view is there are, you know, it's, it's cheap to have an autonomously executed computational contract. There will be layers of those things. Ultimately, you want to anchor what you're doing to the whole world. And the best way to do that is ultimately through sort of human, you know, sort of the human precedent-based legal system type thing, because that's essentially, you know, if you say, I want to, I want to make the most solid anchor for everything I'm doing, then you want the biggest thing. You want to, you want to have something which kind of entrains the whole world rather than something which is kind of a, you know, a, 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 a sort of a small scale thing that operates according to specific sort of gears and levers. But I think that the, you know, having, I mean, it's, it's like automation of everything. I mean, the automation of layers of contracts is presumably adds certain kinds of efficiency, just like the automation of other things adds certain kinds of efficiency. Does one want that? You know, it, it's like, what should the AIs eventually do? Well, we, we want you know, eventually we want to anchor that to our whole sort of culture and, and, and you know, goals and so on. And I, I think that's sort of the same thing that I think you're saying. And I, and I don't disagree with it at all. I think that that's, you know, just like uh, one of the things that confuses me actually about something like ethics, which is kind of, you know, or, or sort of the ultimate recourse of, of how things should work is whereas in science, we're used to the idea we can split off some small sub part of a system and just talk about that. When it comes to ethics, we specifically don't want to do that. We want to have something which asks the question, how does this affect sort of every possible thing in the world? And I, I, I kind of think that that's, um, so, so I agree that there's a, there's a foundation there that, that, um, uh, that works that way. I mean, the early part of this question was about economics. And I, I would say that the, I know, uh, Nassim doesn't believe there's much of a science of economics. And I have to say, I, I have had a very big struggle uh, trying to pin down just what is economics? You know, is it sort of this thing that has certain axiomatic assumptions about how people work and then you work out consequences? Is it this thing that's just sort of empirically trying to see what happens? Um, I have a, a slight hope that some of the uh, ideas from our physics project actually will provide a different raw material for making models in economics. Whether that will happen, and you know, one of the things that could happen is you could make a model, but uh, it's a model of a feature of economics that we humans don't care about. Like you could make some global model of what happens in economics, but the particular thing you want to know is how do I make a trade? And it will tell you absolutely nothing about that. But I think there's a, you know, there's a possible coming attraction of some sort of new modeling methodology that comes from our physics project that might tell you some things about economics, though they might not be things you care about. Andrew Zip. 
All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Nassim. I was at a Ruri uh, meeting a couple of years ago, and I felt that noise and randomness was just undiscovered signal and undecipherable information that it didn't exist in the real world. And people thought I was absolutely crazy. And I hear you saying that maybe that may be true. Is that yeah, true? I mean, uh, yeah. I th well, okay. The digits of pi have well, that's, uh, exactly that's the epistemic versus exactly that's the epistemic versus ontic randomness. So that if you can't tell the difference, if randomness were true, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be different from what generated by a mathematical random number generator, which is entirely deterministic. Use the clock now. So, but you can't reverse. So, so is what if you can't reverse engineer it and can't tell the difference, then functionally, okay, it is random. So that, that's uh, that's what yeah. Steve was saying with the digits of pi, but he uses used the uh, Mathematica and we've seen the the evolution of your random number generator, and that's the one we've been using throughout uh, Ruri to generate uh, you know sequences a different distribution that's entirely deterministic, but it appears to be random because we can't reverse engineer it. But, right. but can I just follow, Stephen, can I just follow up on that? So is Brownian motion, if we could truly understand it, it's not random and like everything's not random if we could truly understand the signal and decipher it? Yeah, I mean, the reason that Brownian motion looks random is because there are a lot of molecules kicking those pollen grains around. If we could trace the motion of every one of those molecules, we would be able to say, and now the pollen grain will be kicked in this particular way, and it will no longer, uh, you know, will no longer consider it random. We consider it random because there's lots of water molecules, and we don't know, uh, you know, we, we the, the two reasons in that case. One, we didn't know how the water molecules were initially set up, and two, we can't trace all the computations that the water molecules are effectively doing as they bounce around. The thing that is surprising is that even if you can know how the water molecules were configured at the beginning, even if the setup is initially very simple, some simple computational rule which you can write down in one line started off from some very simple initial condition, even if you can know exactly what went in, it is still the case that this process of computational irreducibility produces something where you can't predict what it will do, you can't say what it will, will happen, except by basically just running it and seeing what happens. So you can't, you can't just sort of uh, be smarter than the system and say, I know what it's going to do. It doesn't seem random to me because I know what it's going to do. You're, you're just stuck having to just follow through what the system actually does. So yeah. from... Uh, well, we have uh, Andy O'Connor, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have Andy O'Connor and Fernando right after him. So let, let's... let's uh, okay. And then I, I, I suggest doing the following. Around. Each one of you ask a question and then Stephen answers. Okay, go Okay, ahead. so you ask a Perfect. question, Andy, and one sentence, a question, one sentence or two, and Fernando's one sentence or two, and then Stephen after both of them. Yeah, thanks, Nassim. Yeah, and sorry for the rush. You'll be, uh, you'll be exhausted at the end of this. My question is about uh, trust in AI uh, because look, I work in the medical industry. And I'm seeing already just a lot of conversations around how AI like may be used uh, in sort of quality decision making. And it seems to me like AI systems are so complex and undeterministic that like there's gonna be parameters in there that are gonna be extremist then. So we're never gonna be able to really sort of um, trust AI natively. What's your thoughts on that? You think it, it can never get to a point where we trust Right. And Fernando, Fernando. I could just, yeah. Yeah, thank Fernando, you. Uh, um, my question is um, a bit maybe more general. It's like, how big is the risk we are going to run before we, the interaction with the, with the artificial intelligence gets more established and they do all the things we wanted to do? How, I mean, within this process until we reach that stage, how big is the, is the risk that do you think we are, we are running? And just as a small example, there was a plane that crashed, uh, a plane that went from Rio de Janeiro to, to Paris. And uh, one of the reasons at the end of the, all the research that they found out was the reason behind the crash was because pilots were trained to now to run machines rather than piloting a, a plane before pilots were trained to pilot a, a plane in, in different ways. But now they were trained to run a machine like a, 
kind of software engineer. So could this be the case also that could happen with the AIs that would run like, let's say manufacturing plants and all that. And before, before we get into this stable situation where the AIs run everything and we are happy with them, what kind of risks we are going to run? How well, big you know, I, I'm not sure that we'll ever be, you know, my view is that the end state is we've got this whole layer of AI going on in the world, just like the natural world provides, you know, is doing all kinds of things. We don't, you know, we don't claim to understand everything about what the natural world is doing. We manage to coexist with the natural world. We're not absolutely sure the natural world isn't going to wipe us out. It might. Hopefully it won't, but it might. And we can't know that. And the same will be true in kind of our interaction with AIs, but we'll make use of AI just as we make use of resources in the natural world. And that's something that will be of value to us and the things we want to do. I mean, in terms of this question about whether we can ultimately trust an AI, uh, there will be things about AIs that we can't definitively know how they're going to work out. This is the story of computational irreducibility. In a sense, that's also the story of humans. You know, you can say you have some judge who's going to make some, some critical decision. You know, you don't know for sure that that judge isn't going to do something crazy. Um, it's, it's a, uh, uh, you know, what, what tends to be set up in the world is kind of a harness to the whole thing that makes it be something where one feels comfortable that it's sort of going to be okay because you have different, you know, you have, instead of the one AI, you have three AIs and you have them vote. Or you have, instead of one judge, you have three judges and you have them vote or whatever else. You, you end up building up these kind of layers. The one over N, give you... one over N. We call What's it that? one over N, splitting. We call it one over N, splitting, having as, as, as large an N as possible making a decision. Right. To reduce right. your and, risk. Right. And I, I don't know that that's always a good thing. I mean, that, that remains the, you know, that then you have the whole, in the limit, you know, nothing, it's, it's kind of like, as the institution gets bigger, nothing innovative can ever happen, so to speak. I, I you know, it, it's it's um, it's averaging everything out. But but you know, I think these issues are kind of the same for AI as they are for sort of trusting humans, uh, trusting other kinds of things. The only thing about AIs that's a little different is, insofar as AIs are not considered independent things, insofar as AIs can be owned, can be made by companies, things like that. The, the sort of structure of who's really responsible looks a bit different, at least for now. I think I, my guess is that increasingly people will decide that for practical purposes, one should just say that, you know, the AI, like a company, is a, a corporate-like thing that can have its own responsibility. But that's something we haven't reached yet. Um, Great. I so, so I guess, I guess, sorry, yeah, <laughs> you want to run, no? So we want to thank everybody. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, uh, for everything. And thanks uh, early on. Uh, early on, we had uh, 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 Trishank, and and thanks to those who all asked all these questions, including Shabnam and, uh, and all the people who asked questions. Thank you very much. That was a great uh, session. We're one hour over over time, but uh, we'll 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 we'll, we'll adapt. Okay. Thank you very much, and th and have a great day, okay. everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank Amazing you very session. much. Thank you. That Thank was you excellent. Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephen. A lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.